Hey everyone, and welcome back to my Zero Carb Life. I'm Kelly Hogan, and I'm joined here today by my friend Amber O'Hearn, who has been on the show twice before, once to discuss fat versus protein, and I get comments still almost daily from people telling me how helpful that video has been. It is one of my favorite talks that I've ever had, and you also recently came, Amber, onto the chat with all of the OG veteran carnivores, and that was so much fun, so welcome back. Thank you. Yeah, both of those were really fun, and I'm glad to be back. All right, I've got a question here from Georgia87. She wants to know, why does Amber think some people react badly to organs? She says that she gets heartburn when she eats them. She wants to know why. I'm like, quick preface, I did a month of organs every day, and a lot of you said, yeah, that's too much. That was too much. I got very itchy eyes, scratchy throat. I kept feeling, the longer the experiment went, I felt worse and worse. I thought at first I was just catching a cold. By the end of the month, I felt sure that's what it was. I quit the organs and then boop, back to my regular self. I felt good again. Whereas some people say, oh, are you kidding? I don't feel great unless I eat organs. What is up with that? That's a great question. It's a big question. Uh, first of all, I think organs is probably too big a word. I think that um, there are a lot of organs that probably don't cause people that much trouble like heart and brain um and there there's many things you could eat you could even consider fat an organ but but i think what we're really talking about is liver right because <laughs> yeah. liver is the one yeah. that 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 it's the easiest to find in our culture um other ones are kind of almost non-existent you'd really have to go to a butcher in special order probably to get them well maybe heart but anyway liver is the one that is it's considered highly nutritionally dense. And so it's recommended by a lot of people. All of the organs actually have different vitamin profiles. So they would have different strengths and weaknesses, say for a particular nutrient, but liver in particular is very high in vitamin A and also in copper. And those are the two elements of it that might be causing problems for people because there's, there's a a toxicity level that you could be going over. Now, a lot of people really are really adamant that you cannot get um, vitamin A toxicity from eating liver, but I, I think they're wrong for a few reasons. I think one of the reasons that we don't come across that a lot in the literature is that most people have not before now taken it into their heads to eat it to such a, an excess, like to try to get it in every day as a way to, to, get their vitamins. And so maybe it didn't come up just because it was, you know, people would eat it now and then, and they would never eat it to that degree. The other reason is that when we eat vitamin A, our liver stores it. That's why it's high in liver, right? The liver is a storage organ, but there's a pretty large uh, capacity for the liver to store vitamin A. So if you look at the studies for you know, what is a good amount, a safe amount that you can take of vitamin A before it becomes a problem, they're only looking at a, a limited time, right? So they could say, oh, if you take this amount and you take it for 200 days, then you will not have issues of toxicity. But <laughs> the problem with that logic is that there's a buffer. It's like there's, there's a set amount. And after that, you're going to start overflowing. So if you're chronically taking in more than the body has the ability to deal with, eventually, even your liver is not going to be able to hold it. And in, in our society, you know, vitamin A deficiency is a real problem in some developing countries where they don't have, they have neither much access to animal source foods, nor do they have uh, much fortification, although there are some efforts going on in different places for fortification. But here, many things are fortified with vitamin A. So it, it's actually quite possible that a lot of people are running either on the edge or actually at a kind of low level of chronic hypervitaminosis, excess vitamin A. There was actually a study, they had to have look at people who had died. So it was autopsies and it was only 10 or 20 people, but a third of them had too much vitamin A at like when they looked at their liver. And I thought that was really surprising because it's not something we ever talk about. And the RDA itself is actually arguably too high, even not for carnivores. There was, they actually, a group of scientists tried to challenge it and change it in the 1980s, just bring it down like 30% or something, because they thought there's no evidence that we need that much. And the potential dangers exist, especially for pregnant women, because it can cause 
birth mutations. Oh. And they actually, they didn't succeed in getting them changed because the committee said, oh, if we changed our message about that, it would be confusing to the public. Uh, there's actually a paper I can show oh. you with that. Um, so even for people who are not getting what carnivores get, the levels, the RDA levels might be a little bit too high. But then you, if you think about, well, what could be some factors that might make a carnivore um, have be more prone to that? I'm not sure that they are, but it does seem to me that that carnivores are getting, well, first of all, when you absorb vitamin A, something that really enhances absorption is fat. And obviously anyone on a ketogenic diet of any kind is eating a lot more fat. So potentially that's helping the absorption. Um, animal fat, <laughs> besides the liver, the other place in the body that stores a lot of vitamin A is, is actually your fat tissue. So animal fat will have some of that. And if we're eating high levels of, you know, if we're eating our 80, 20 gram beef, that's, it, it may just add up for us um, in a way that, that it might not for people who are not eating so much meat. Yeah, I think it could just contribute to a general feeling of malaise. Okay. That, so if you're eating a lot of liver and you're starting to get those symptoms and some, a lot of them might appear to be like histamine reaction symptoms. And, and I think that it might actually be vitamin A in some cases where people think it's a histamine intolerance. Oh, okay. I'll tell you, I had really planned on saying this cause it sounds completely nuts, but the <laughs> more, I mean, seriously, I've, I've told Amy Berger this and she was like, I'm not really sure what that would be. And I thought, oh, this is nuts. But I'm going to tell you now, the more organs I ate, I basically felt less motivated and I didn't have the hyper sense. So normally I'm really passionate about things. I just care so much. And I'm really inner, like I want to do all of the interviews and all of the Instagram stories. And I just I have a, a lot of drive. I don't know if you've picked up on that, but I'm kind of hyped up. <laughs> I get a little excited. I honestly felt like the shine was toned down for me. It wasn't just physical. I did feel very itchy and scratchy, but I also just had a little bit of a toot about me where I just didn't care. And I thought, I, I can't obviously say for sure that that's what it was, but I don't go around changing much in my life and my attitude doesn't change much. Cycle wise, I have no idea when mine is coming at all without a calendar. It's not that something I just had a different attitude and I know diet can influence our attitude. So I know that's not completely out of the question, but yeah. I don't know if you've ever heard anything like that before. Probably not. <laughs> No, but I haven't talked to a lot of people who have tried to maintain a high liver diet, yeah. except for my roommate, Siobhan, who has written about this on Cholesterol Code, actually. She had, was doing a, it was actually a high fat, uh, lower protein experiment. Oh. And as she wanted to sort of emulate the paleolithic ketogenic diet, the PKD from yeah. Paleo Medicina. In, in a certain way, except without um, food restriction. And, and so she was front loading the fat and she was eating a little bit of liver every day. And as the days went on, it's, she start, it was less and less appealing for one thing. And I wanna come back to that idea, um, but it was less and less appealing and eventually started making her feel ill, but she stubbornly tried to keep eating it anyway. And, and then it physically made her vomit. Um, <laughs> and so then she finally said, okay, I'm listening now, <laughs> but on that topic of it be, being less appealing, you know, I'm not saying that no one should ever eat liver and, or that vitamin A deficiency isn't a real problem. And I think that some people, especially early on in the carnivore diet may actually benefit from having some liver, but once they're replete, maybe, maybe they don't need so much anymore. And in my own personal experience with it, just from a kind of listen to your body um, perspective is that every once in a while I'll, I'll think of liver and think, Oh yeah, I really want some liver. And then I'll, I'll cook a whole bunch and I'll eat a bunch for like a day. And then by a day and a half or so later, I'm like, mm, I don't want any more of that. It's just completely unappealing. And oh. so, you know, maybe it's just the, the fluctuation of our own needs. <laughs> I think that sounds completely plausible. I do. I mean, 
like I said, at first it didn't bother me at all, but the longer I went, the worse it was. And it did seem more, it seemed less and less appetizing. And just like Chabot and I kept forcing it because this is the month. That's my organ experience. Exactly. <laughs> and my body was like, yeah, that's stupid. Why are you doing that? And I really don't think the beef part bothered me as much as the liver. I really do think it was more the liver. And I was doing a lot of chicken liver. I did mm. some beef liver too, but I, I don't know. I felt the most symptoms when I would, I felt like when I would eat the chicken liver. Yeah, I think it's probably like a lot of things. It might be fine and even useful in some cases, and you can also overdo it. Yeah. Uh, and if it can be overdone, <laughs> I got this. That's You're great. not one of those halfway people, Kelly. <laughs> no, I'm really not. Okay, Renee98 wants to know if you have any suggestions for leg cramps. Now, just today, I did an Instagram story about leg cramps because I do feel like this is one of the most broad difficult. I know right now that you're not going to have a super simple answer because you would be a billionaire right now, right? Right. <laughs> People struggle with this. We hear it all the time. And it's not like it's just carnivores that runs in my family. And I'm, I'm a first generation carnivore in my family, <laughs> <laughs> but definitely leg cramps go way back. And, and, you know, I've heard grandparents talk about being up and down during the, it's always night leg cramps. I have recently discovered that for me, mouth taping to encourage myself to breathe through my nose, this mm -hmm. is a new experiment, but honest to goodness, I have not had leg cramps. I do feel more rested. And my dad was having, what made me think to do that was he got a CPAP machine and suddenly his leg cramps stopped. And his doctor, his sleep doctor said, oh, that's very common. I hear that a lot. And I thought, maybe it's not food at all. I thought before it's my food, which I'm sure in some cases it is. I think it can probably be many things. And yes, I really will let you answer this. But <laughs> I no, think please. sometimes it might be my shoes because sometimes I wear flip flops and then end up with more leg cramps in the summer. But in this case, I feel like it might literally be my oxygen levels because I tend to be a mouth breather at night. And if I mouth tape, I wake up feeling so rested I know I'm getting better sleep and my legs aren't cramping. That is fascinating. You know, I have met a couple of people recently who have told me that mouth tape changed their life. <laughs> um, I have tried it and I think, you know, it's hard to tell what you do when you sleep. I think maybe I don't have that. Okay. Um, Cause the mouth tape didn't seem to improve sleep for me, but the idea that it could help um, with cramps that's, that's something I've never heard. And that's really, really interesting. But you're also right that there seem to be a lot of different things that could be potentially the cause of cramps. And also maybe because of that, there's no universal solution. Right. Um, obviously electrolyte balance can be part of that. And I think when you're adapting to a ketogenic diet, for sure, that's a really common problem that's supposedly temporary for most people. Right. And then, so, <laughs> but what you do about that, it, it depends, right. Cause it's, if it's an electrolyte balance problem, you can throw a bunch at it. You can throw potassium. Potassium worked really well for me when I first started a ketogenic diet, bizarrely fast, like faster than it should <laughs> take. Okay. Um, and magnesium helps some people, sodium helps some people. But on the other hand, I've also heard people when they stop taking salt, that their cramps will go away. Cramps in my legs tend to associate with periods of weight loss. So yes. that is at least could be a silver lining to it, even if you can't fix it. <laughs> that is so funny. I have said that to people before. I don't weigh myself often, like just a few times per year, but almost like clockwork. If I'm down uh, even a couple pounds in weight, I will get a leg cramp. And I'm mm -hmm. like, well, I'm probably just losing a little weight, but yeah. Oh, and well, the magnesium, I have tried magnesium spray. Mm -hmm. um, Judy Cho is a big fan of the topical magnesium. And so I do think that's an option for people who don't like actually taking things. I know it basically works out the same, but I've heard that it actually absorbs very quickly. And I have tried that, but I have sprayed my legs down before and still woken up that night with a leg cramp. It was enough things that I was trying that it made me think, I really do not think this is my diet. 
And I, and James at that point started saying, man, you are a loud sleeper. I was like, I am not. Said, <laughs> what does that even mean? <laughs> I said, I'm so quiet. I don't even hear a thing. <laughs> he said, and I don't have tonsils. I, said, I don't have tonsils. I don't have adenoids. I can't be a loud sleeper. He's like, I don't know what's loud in there, but something is loud. And he said, I was startling myself awake a lot. Oh, scary. Yes. And I, but it wasn't fully awake because I didn't know I was doing it. I would say to him, no, I didn't wake up all night. And he's like, you woke up loud enough of a jerk that it wakes him up. Mm. So I was going to go to have a sleep study done. It was supposed to have been Monday of this week, but I ended up canceling because the mouth taping thing was so good for me. James says he cannot hear a thing. And he actually strongly suggests that I start doing it during the day. (laughs) what a thing to say (laughs) but as far as how quiet I am in the night he says it's really been he says I don't startle him at all anymore and I have not had a leg cramp since it started so if people are looking for some ideas there's several of them right there but I honestly do not think it is going to be the same solution for everybody that salt thread at Zaya recently was very eye-opening so many people trying the no salt experiment and repeatedly I read during that that they were experiencing so many positive things including no more leg cramps now I do use yeah. salt to taste you do too I so, don't salt no. oh don't salt okay Mm-mm. so there's quite a few carnivores that don't and then there's people like myself where I use it if I want and then I have long periods where I don't want any but mm-hmm. I, I was really blown away by that thread, the no salt thread with the correlation with cramps, especially. Yeah. Oh. Even I was surprised oh. about that. Yeah. Um, cause, cause I, I know that there are a lot of us that, that don't use much salt. Uh-huh. Um, but I wasn't expecting to see so many people report actual, you know, palpable benefits within a short period of time. All right, Amber, I've had a few people ask me about triglycerides. Typically on a carnivore diet, we see triglycerides go down. HDL goes up and everyone's happy except for your general practitioner who has no idea that it matters. And, and, you know, as a carnivore, we're thrilled, but every once in a while we see somebody say, I went on a carnivore diet and triglycerides went up. Now, what I normally tell people, even as a nobody is if you got them checked in the first six months, I think none of it means anything because it's all over the place when people start any new diet. I think blood work just goes haywire. It might be high today and low tomorrow, but do you ever see people who even after that adaption period, adaptation period, that triglycerides still go up? Yeah, I know two things about that. And then I have a really great resource. So the two things that I know that can do that, one is not for everyone, but there are, are as a subset of people, not me, thank God, for whom <laughs> drinking coffee seems to really skyrocket the triglycerides. Oh. Um, and then the other one is um, not fasting adequately before your test. If you're not between 12 and 14 hours fasted, you might have a lingering of the the fat that was actually from your last meal. And it seems to be the case that the more saturated that fat is, the longer it will persist in the blood. So, so you really have to wait that time. So that could be a part of it. There are some other things that can result in higher triglycerides in people on low carb. And there's an excellent article on it at the Cholesterol Code website, cholesterolcode.com for, from Dave Feldman and Siobhan Huggins, who've talked about that, it, that very phenomenon. Oh, great. Okay. That was good information. Petey pie 98 wants to know, does <laughs> you ever think it matters if people eat grass fed versus grain fed meats? I don't know anyone who was unable to get the benefits of a carnivore diet just on grain finished meat. Yeah. So, so I don't think it's necessary. Maybe there is some small faction of people who would do better I don't think it's the typical case, but let's talk about for a minute what it means to be getting grass fed versus or grass finished versus grain finished. There are some nutrients that appear to be a little bit higher in grass finished. Yeah. Uh, one of those would be vitamin A. <laughs> uh, that's what makes the fat turn yellow. Although I think that might be the beta carotene version. There's also um, 
a, a slight change in the fatty acid profile so that there's a bit more omega-3, but I think that the absolute amounts might be too small to matter. I do think that when you're buying a lot of meat, you start becoming very conscious of the quality of life that the animals you're depending on are getting. And I don't think necessarily that conventionally raised meat has to be the horrific things that some people have advertised. <laughs> um, I'm not saying that bad things don't happen, but I think that might not be the typical case. And I think that you can you can raise meat with grain finishing without being cruel. Yeah. But I, th I also think that it's that there seems to be a really high correlation between grass finishing and a uh, really holistic kind of farming that could be better for everyone involved. It's it's a bit nuanced. Yeah, I was just saying to James the other day, I prefer the taste of grain finished beef. I just do. Some mm -hmm. people think that's crazy. I prefer the price as well. That's less crazy. I know. But <laughs> the taste even, I just like it. I have tried both. But then I watched Sacred Cow and I was like, man, I really need to buy from a farmer. So I thought <laughs> maybe I could just ask a farmer, be really nice to my cow. I will buy the cow from you, but could you <laughs> Give it some grain right before you kill it. Just <laughs> Well, the thing about that is it's probably just about the fat and the marbling, right? So if you want to get that much fat marbling with, the, with grass finished, well, there's two things I think that can affect that. One is the age. I think it just takes a lot longer to get that level of fat. And people aren't normally willing to let the let the cow live that long because it messes with production cycles. Um, it, so if we could convince grass fed farmers to let them graze longer, that might help. But yeah. the other thing is breeds. And there's a, there's this weird um, unfortunate thing where I think the earliest adopters of grass finished beef were the same people who believed that lean meat was healthier. So, oh, cool. so my suspicion is that a lot of the, the more uh, successful sellers of grass fed beef are those who are also trying to sell a lean product. So huh. you, you have this unfortunate coincidence of, of factors. But yet, so I would really love to be able to get grass fed beef that's also very marbled and fat. Yes. Uh, hopefully we can push that market. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I am not opposed at all to going to a local farmer, and I have done it before. I have stocked the freezer with local meat, but I legitimately did not like the taste as much. So I am in favor of having nicely pastured cows. We have lots of cows and farmland around here in North Carolina, but I... I just really like the taste of my grocery store beef also. <laughs> I need to find, I'm sure that's got to be a thing that I could get both, maybe. All right. There's been some discussion about the acid molecule found in non-human mammals called the NEU5GC, which stands for N-glycolneuraminic acid. Woo. They want to know your thoughts on it, and I'm glad they don't want to know mine because I don't have any. <laughs> okay, uh, I don't have really a lot to say about that, but I have looked into that in the past, and I looked at the studies um, trying to show that connection. And what what stood out to me about those studies is that what the researchers were setting out to do was to explain why meat is so bad for you. Okay. So it rests on this assumption that meat is bad for you. And they're, they, they're supporting that, that idea with some uh, epidemiological studies that show very weak associations between certain kinds of cr uh, chronic diseases and meat intake. So then they're saying, well, now that we know that meat causes those diseases, what might the mechanism be? And here's a potential mechanism that looks like it could be contributing to that. But as you and I know, <laughs> that's just, there is no thing to explain. <laughs> like There isn't a connection other than this spurious one between meat and those diseases. I just do not think it exists. I don't think the literature really shows that. Yeah. And so to try to find a mechanism to explain something that isn't even happening is, is a non-starter for me. Yeah. I listened to Georgia E the other day give a talk about the World Health organization's recommendations against meat 
and it was fire. It was, <laughs> it was really, <laughs> yes. really good. I don't remember if she specifically talked about the NEU 5GC or not, but I did Google it when it was Ruth that asked the question. When Ruth asked it, I thought, what on earth is that? And yeah, there's supposed to be a correlation between that acid and cancer. But you're right, it did. It seemed like what I was reading started with the assumption of, so something in meat is making us sick. Maybe it's the NEU 5GC. And then I was like, what? Something in meat <laughs> is making me healthy. Maybe it's the <laughs> NEU 5GC. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. So, so for NEU 5GC to be causing cancer, we would have to actually see meat causing cancer. And that is not what's happening. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'll link to her, to the Georgia Eid talk. It's been a little while since I listened to it, but it was definitely all about the World Health Organization's um, anti-meat talk yeah. and she basically just knocked it down one by one on why it was so baseless oh yeah 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 she, it, she m made a clever title it was called uh, who as in the world health organization yeah. who says meat causes cancer yes that's <laughs> the one I watched it was yeah. so good in fact as soon as I finished listening to her I emailed and said come on and talk to me about this. And she says that she will in January. So I'm excited. To That's fantastic news. She is yeah. wonderful. I'm a big, big fan. All right. But it does not concern you either. No. Okay. It's, I'm glad it's not keeping you up at night either, Amber. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, this was a private question from someone with the initials CS who did not want to be named. She wants to know, why do you think when she starts carnivore, she says she always, she's, she was very kind. She said, I watch you on Instagram, Kelly, and you make carnivore look so fun. And I'm like, yes, it is so fun. She says, so I start <laughs> carnivore and then she gets a yeast infection. And I was <laughs> like, a yeast infection? I don't, what's the correlation? Why would that be? There seem to be a lot of things about candida in general that are not very well based in science and other things that are. And I've had a hard time when combing through all the different things about it, trying to figure out which things are, are real phenomena and which things are not. Mm -hmm. um, but if I were to give the biggest benefit of the doubt to those sites that talk about candida infections, one of the things that they say is that you can have outbreaks when um, as a kind of, I hate to use the word, but a kind of detoxification, like you're, you've taken away all their sugar yeah. and now now they're trying to survive. That's the best thing I can come up with. I don't really know. I told her that it's not like carnivores are just rampantly having yeast infections. I don't think that's any like ongoing thing that carnivores struggle with, that maybe it's just something. No. In, in fact, that's another one of the things that completely stopped happening for me on carnivore. Yep. I, same. I remember as a newlywed, I I did have to deal with it. I was very sick. I don't think it had anything to do with marrying James. I just was very sick <laughs> about the time. Well, I want to clear that up. Around the time I got married, I was very overweight and I felt so bad. And the few years following marriage was when I was getting all those boils and I was also getting yeast infections. And all of that cleared up for me when I cut out carbs, but I didn't go straight carnivore. I did five whole years of very low carb. And people mm -hmm. have asked, do I think it helped to cut out mostly sugar and breads first? And I had some plants in my diet for five years. And then in 2009 total, and I don't know, maybe, but I don't remember getting a yeast infection either when I started low carb or definitely, I know I didn't when I started carnivore. If her non-carnivore diet is high carb, maybe she could try um, just going to a low carb diet and seeing if the same thing happens or not. It might be informative. Or to ease into things. Maybe. You know, a lot of times I tell people, oh, it's fine to just go cold, tur cold turkey carnivore. But that, and I do think that's fine. People do it all the time, but that's not how I did it. A lot of us, I think, tried low carb first. A lot of people try keto first. And then eventually moved to total carnivore. But, you know, I've seen people do it both ways. But yeah, you're right. If she's going from pizza to then all meat and getting a yeast infection, might maybe try stepping it down a little bit first. Yeah, I don't maybe. know. Hard to say. Yeah, I know. I don't think it's a common thing. I don't hear that a lot. Okay, I have a feeling that after this one comes out, there will be even more questions for you. Uh, people, they love you. Every time I post that you're coming on the show, I get people or just 
thrilled. They love Aww. your sensibility and just your calm, chill demeanor. And I do too. I love you, Amber. Aww. And thank you for coming back. And I love you too, Kelly. I'm glad about the friendship we've been developing because there was this long period after the forum kind of dissolved and went over to Facebook that we didn't interact as much. And now we're interacting more and, and we got to meet in person. And yes. I'm just really happy about that. Me too. Thanks, Amber. I hope to have you again soon. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye.